Uh, so it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Roger Mader. Uh, Roger and I had the pleasure of working with each other this summer at Fahrenheit 212, an innovation consultancy in New York City. Um, while there, Roger became both a mentor and a friend. Um, and while we came from kind of distinctly different backgrounds, I think we realized that we had kind of a much more common dialogue than we uh, ever would have expected. Um, and I think that that thread was, was design methodology. Um, and that what he really did is, is taught me to look at how we need to work past assumptions and speculations and kind of really build business scenarios into the design decisions that we make. Um, and I think what I always do is kind of pushing his buttons and really trying to say, well, why are we looking here when we can be looking here? Um, and so uh, just to give you a little bit of background on him, uh, he recently started uh, Velo Group, which is information or uh, innovation architects in New York City. Um, prior to that, he's worked at Ernst & Young. Uh, Monitor Group, um, Accenture, um, am I forgetting anyone? That'll do. That'll do. Uh, he's co-authored two books, um, and he currently teaches a business ethic ethics class at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Um, so let's welcome Roger. Again, it's Roger Mader. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. It's a pleasure. Um, let me give you a little bit of context for the introduction that Pete just provided, because I think it is essential to the way that we engage in the dialogue this evening, and the reason that uh, Pete and I kind of structured the conversation that you'll be seeing tonight. One of the things that we learned through our collaboration this summer is that the, uh, the, the thesis and method of design requires the grounding uh, and the rigor of business analytics in order to bring together the ideal solution for your client, yourself, your student, your administrator, your constituency. And the reason I say that is because it is almost as though one were to create art without understanding the message of the audience uh, and the impact one's trying to convey. And you have to bring both of those together. And so when you've got a commercial application, as I do in the work that I have, I am constantly trying to take the best design competence to solve what is in essence a business problem. And as Peter said, his attempts to constantly get me to think about how broad the boundaries should be for solving that problem led to the thinking behind this conversation that you'll have today. This is about understanding where the future is going to arrive. There's a classic quote since we're in a hockey town from Wayne Gretzky when asked about how he managed to play hockey so fluidly, so well, and, and with such anticipation for where the next goal was going to come from. He said that, it wasn't very difficult. All he did was skate to where the puck was going to be. This presentation is about figuring out where the puck's going to be. And I'd like you to think about that in the context of your careers. Those of you who are pursuing thesis work right now, think about how do I take the ambition I have behind that work and put it into a context that has the most significant opportunity for impact in my career and the lives of those who, to whom I direct this work. The way that we do that is by understanding that the future, in fact, is already here. It's our job to find it, distill it, and project it so it intersects with the goals that we have. So we're going to talk about how that might work. Let me first review with you the objectives that uh, Glenn was suggesting for the architectural certification. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of this thing, you should be able to describe how to anticipate market change through trend analysis. We're essentially citing past trends that foreshadow where the directions are going, analyzing those trends as you project them into the future, and in the last point, at that point of convergence, trying to anticipate where new demand, new growth, and new opportunity will emerge. It's actually a very simple technique. It's actually getting, discerning which trends matter and the timing of their arrival that's everything. And by the way, I will be posing questions of you in sort of an indirect relationship to your proximity to me. So those of you hiding back there, there's no escape. Um, does anybody recognize this thing? Jules Verne. Anybody know the name of this vessel? The no nicely done. This is the Nautilus. It is a depiction from the 1950s Walt Disney uh, live action film where they were doing um, a essentially a, a video depiction of the story that was written in the late 19th century, 20,000 Leagues Beneath the Sea. And in that story, Captain Nemo takes the Nautilus, an electric submarine under the Arctic ice cap, before it was certain that you could do that, 
uh, on what was basically an intercontinental, uh, transcontinental, intercontinental journey. This, if you look closely enough at the bottom right, you'll see on the flank of this vessel is also the Nautilus, a, a vessel entering New York Harbor in 1956 that effectively accomplished exactly what Jules Verne had stated uh, almost 100 years, or just short of 100 years earlier. And the question that this suggests um, that we pr pursue is, how do these prescient um, insights occur? Where, why is it that we so often see science fiction become reality uh, and that the forecasts and prognostications of people who are looking at the edge do show up eventually? And this wasn't the only instance of that. This is Jules Verne. You can see that he, he died just early into the 20th century. Most of his work sort of gravitated around the Civil War era in this country. And he, among his writings, uh, had, did an article in 1889 that forecast this first thing, which was uh, newscasts. He basically wrote an article about uh, a, a prospective news reading that would be somehow read out to subscribers every morning, and they would engage in hearing the news in a dialogue between uh, a, a reporter or interviewer and an interviewee or subject matter expert. Uh, the, at least 50 years before, no, 30 years before that was possible, uh, and 50 years before it happened in telecast form. He also was a student of advertising and had projected the idea that advertising might be reflected off of low atmospheric cloud cover. And so this, and therefore able to uh, uh, be transmitted to large, massive local audiences. He, in uh, From the Earth to the Moon, written in 1865, he talked about uh, solar-powered um, uh, spacecraft, which then came to exist. And this is called the Sail D, which uh, travels on solar winds, in essence, uh, and is powered by solar energy. And he also, in that same book, uh, projected the possibility of, of a lunar module, something that would be delivered to the moon and function as a, as a vehicle for human investigation. So this um, suggests that the, in the entire sort of body of his work, his major works, had some grounding in a future that was going to arrive. And when asked how this could happen, uh, because he, I mean, one of the ways it could happen is just conjecture lots of crap and 5% of it shows up. That wasn't the case with him. Uh, that's the case with a lot of people, but that wasn't the case with him. And the, the um, sort of assessment done by his biographer simply said that he was a very astute member of society. He was an, an academic and a, basically a hobby scientist, which was a pretty common way to be a scientist back in the day before it was fully professionalized. And in essence, what he was doing was uh, making commentary on the things that were already going on around him and were reasonable projections of the things that he could see in that day. And so her conclusion was that it wasn't magic, he was just paying attention. Our goal today is to start finding new ways to pay attention. Does anybody recognize this gentleman, William Ford Gibson? He is a modern sort of equivalent of Jules Verne. He's referred to as the noir prince of cyberpunk. Uh, in 1984, he wrote Neuromancer. He had previously coined the term cyberspace. In Neuromancer, he essentially, uh, in which he used the term matrix to describe a, uh, the interwebs that he imagined arriving in some future state by virtue of the stuff that was already happening with DARPA and, and the other uh, advancements in, in communications between what were then large organized entities. Um, and he uh, continued to prognosticate about a number of things that included the arrival of reality shows and a number of other things. He's a, a living member of the Literati today. Um, and when asked how he was going about that, he said, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. I'd like to ask the back of the room what you think that means. Anybody, and you're going to have to shout it out. What does that mean? Oh, you better be paying attention because I'm going to call on you if you don't shout at me. Sporadic. It's sporadic. It's unevenly distributed because it it's shows up in a lot of different places. Is that what I heard? 
Sporadic? Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. You saved that guy. Um, um, as you'll see, this quote was just um, in the past decade. And essentially what he was saying is, the future is showing up, but it's outside of the places where you're looking for it today. In the work that Peter and I did together, what we were helping our clients understand is that when you start trying to invent within an industry sector or within a profession, you can find where it's already emerging in adjacent places. And once you do that, you can start to adopt the underlying design theory that's making it possible in one place and therefore making it relevant in another. So the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. We have to go find it. So where do you start to look for the future? I would suggest to you this quote from uh, George Santayana, the uh, brilliant Spanish philosopher, novelist, and essayist who suggested those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So the first thing we need to do is delve into the underlying design, if you will, of the challenge that you face as it has been evoked through history. I'd like to, I'd like to ask your indulgence to investigate this in a particularly relevant industry context right now in the wake of the financial meltdown that has tormented our economy and rippled through the world. So here's an early instance uh, in an El Greco painting of a conflict that happens in the financial services market. This is, this is, uh, this is Jesus ev evacuating the money lenders from the temple. Um, and it was really a late stage in the ev evolution of financial services and currency exchanges for the 99% to kind of rise in an uproar. Um, it did have a backlash. You find a thousand years later, this guy shows up. He is a, he's a Danish Viking who is now, at this time, an inhabitant on the uh, eastern coast of Ireland who was a, a Danish poll tax collector. And your penalty for, failing, for essentially dodging your taxes was to have your nose uh, severed with some massive sword you had. You'd literally put it up your nostril and flick it and basically blow out one side of your nostril. And thus, the phrase that you were paying through the nose. And you will find a lot of these phrases that, that don't show up in Shakespeare, show up through horrific stories like this. So the history of the financial services sector, and in particularly the currency exchange that enables consumer finance, is one that's full of interesting historic antecedents, and one that allowed uh, for an evaluation of where the future might arrive in this sector. If you really go back in history, you find the first coinage, which is this. It's called salt. Um, in 6050 BC, it was used as the coin of trade between the Egyptian and Phoenician traders. It, go, it continues to go through history in a monumental way because it's essential to human life. It shows up on essentially desert coastlines where it just happens to be either encrusted or near the surface. So there's speculation that human civilization was formulated typically on these coastal plains that were had a desert-like climate because salt was so readily available. Um, it shows up in 1000 BC as a form of payment for uh, Greek, Greek slave traders were using salt as the form of currency in slave trade, and thus the phrase that you aren't worth your salt, which means you weren't worth the salt that we were paying for you. Um, it is the basis of the word solarium, which is the, the word salary that we know today because legionnaires in the, in the Roman legions were paid with salt because it was a currency of the realm that you could exchange for almost anything. So the notion was that you've liberated people from the barter of a pig for an angry bird by giving them something that they could use as the, the, the currency of trade in order to liquid, uh, create a liquid market that you could then take globally and internationally. That uh, in... When was this one? This is about uh, this is about 600 BC. This is a Chinese coin. This is the first minted. Uh, is that right? Yeah, this is the first minted coin of base metals. It is actually a replica of a cowrie shell. So there was there was a currency being used in mainland China at the time that were shells in essence. And in order to regulate that, they started minting metal shells. And they put the hole in it just like they used to put in the shell so that you could put it on a, essentially wear it as a necklace or a, a bracelet so that you could, you, that was the original wallet, which I think is kind of cool. And I'd like to see it come back. And <laughs> you appear to have the equipment to drill holes in all my coins. I'll be delivering them to you forthwith. Um, then you've got a version of the first silver coin. This is from, this shows up in Turkey during the Greek 
expansion or the Macedonian expansion into what is Turkey today. Um, then the gold standard, which was adopted by much of the world. This was in order to eliminate the, the, what were then thought to be the primary causes of inflation. So now, you know, if you can mint money and it's tied to nothing, how do you know what it's worth? And all of a sudden the money becomes worthless, so what if we peg it to something that has latent worth, which is also, by the way, the, the reason the coin was minted in silver. Silver was rare, so it had latent worth. And coins originally, like pieces of eight, were directly tied to the value of the metal they were that they were uh, minted in. So a piece of eight literally was a coin. They had cut up into eight pizza slices and trade in the pieces of the coin. Then, of course, you get paper currency, which begets one that really befuddled uh, the, the SEC in its day. This is the American Express Traveler's Check. The first of these were produced in small quantity in England in 1779. Uh, but they became popularized in mass when the president of American Express was traveling in small European cities and they wouldn't accept his letters of credit. So he said, oh, screw you, I'll make my own credit. And what happened, in fact, was by creating these pre-printed, basically monetary promissory notes, he added, or American Express added significantly to the money supply. And when you've got monetary policy that you're trying to regulate in a, in a country, Having somebody else capable of adding to the money supply besides the government is kind of shocking. Now we're doing it with like stuff in Farmville. So, uh, you know, that's, we've, we've sort of lost track. In fact, we got rid of the gold because we couldn't regulate that anymore. Uh, and there's lots of debate, by the way, now, particularly with uh, the inflationary pressures in our own economy of printing money like it's going out of style in this country um, in order to basically buy your way out of uh, recession. Uh, you know, what the implications for that will be. And there's a lot of, there's concern that we should be pegged to something of value again, et cetera. Um, and then it's funny, if you work in the banking circles, the last innovation of note that anyone talks about was the ATM, which in fact, if you think of it from an infra infrastructure standpoint, had a huge impact on, you know, sort of liberating the human transaction costs of, of banking as it is today. And if I ever find myself having to stand in line to talk to a teller, I want to punch them by the time I get to the end of the line. It's very interesting, I was telling Peter that I've been working in innovation with one of the major hotel groups. And they have this thesis that it re that's, that's quite admirable that what they're there to do is deliver nothing but supreme service. It's the art of hospitality and it's done through the interpersonal connection. And so, but the way that that could mistranslate is that you need to make people stand in line to deal with a human being in order to be able to deliver that service. And in fact, it has the contravening effect. So um, this was a, an important innovation in also liberating people from sort of the limitations of liquidity. I tell you all that simply to say, there is a long history that you should explore of the innovations. And if you deconstruct every one of these, they, which is not intentional on my part, but what, what you find is, they really are all accomplishing one thing, which is essentially making it easier for you to conduct a transaction. They're all making the exchange more liquid, more fluid, more uh, higher velocity uh, with lower friction costs. And if you, if you then said, well, wh what are the friction costs I have today? And you could remove those. Peter's trying to riot. I'm sorry that you talked to me about your personal life. Peter's trying to refinance his, his place right now and is running into all the, all the transaction friction points of just, you know, kind of legal cycles and people being slow to respond and 17 different people needing to consult on a single decision. And it's remarkable how much more effective you could make those transactions if you really focused on taking the lessons of salt and applying them to the demand curve that you see today. Now, once you're done investigating the past, how do you begin to project into the future? When you look in the past, you're using something like that, pick, to dig into the archival evidence that's under our feet. But when you start to project into the future, you need to use a broader lens. So I'd suggest to you where you might have used a pick for the past. In the future, say you're trying to, to find uh, an oil deposit, what you might use is something that looks more like this, which is basically the convergence of three technologies to identify where there are fissures and possible reserves under the surface of the Earth. And the, yeah, it's basically, it's, it's satellite technology that's, that's using uh, spectrography to, to use different light waves to determine where those fissures might be, 
by getting essentially a radiation frequency off of the elements in the ground, and then there's a separate one that's done on the ground that's giving you essentially the topography. So you can you you basically have to triangulate the topography versus the fissures. Blah blah blah. Three things. Um, but the point is, what you're doing is using more sophisticated technology and a wider field of view in order to be able to try and pinpoint where those opportunities might lie. That is roughly an analogy for what we're going to be talking about doing in the work that you engage in in your profession. Maybe. There we go. So, projecting the future of the financial services, what I'm going to propose to you is that what you try and do is scan the world for what's already happening that would suggest future demand. First, the way we have done this uh, in my past work, and I worked with an organization called the Doblin Group. It's an innovation boutique, 30 years old, one of the first in the field, uh, born out of the Institute of Design in Chicago, who, who uh, first conceived this method, although it is basically the underpinnings of what you're doing if you do a sophisticated Google search today, which is basically taking a very structured queried approach, at, in this case, at what are the domains of transactions that take place that are relevant to consumers? And through a series of interviews and industry research, we came up with these six. So that was sort of a shocking arrival. Roles, you know, what are the roles that different people play? Let's go back to Peter. If you're going to try and refinance, who, what are the roles different people play? You kind of need to understand that because that's how you find the points of friction, the different demands that people have in order to get that do deal done. What transactions they engage in, and it's typically a multiple string of transactions that you have to assemble into the ultimate goal you're trying to achieve. What products are already available out there to make that happen. What are the regulatory constraints? What are the technologies that enable? And what are the, the means of consumption by which those transactions are conducted? Take those. Scan the world and find what's happening in each of those buckets, if you will, through essentially an algorithm that allows you to look at both proprietary and public data and start parsing hits. That could be something like a press release from Bank of America saying that we're issuing a new loan instrument that falls under products. Or it could be about the way that the unbanked, people who are kind of at the fringe of the economy, are creating new ways of loaning amongst themselves in communities, which describes new roles and forms of transaction for consumption at the fringe. So you can see how uh, any of these, these data points might show up in multiple of these buckets, and which is fine. We count the hit wherever it shows up, and we allow it to be double counted. Now, it's very helpful if you also have a point of view on the trends that are happening generally in the world. So we then map those to these eight change drivers. These, this is a uh, proprietary model that develop, was developed by Doblin Group after doing thousands of these queries and determining this is where currently the trend lines seem to have boundaries. So essentially what they said were the domains of change that are taking place in the world have to do with evolutions in sustainability, connectivity, digitization, the user experience, globalization, identity and what, you know, the identity meaning not only who we are but how we protect and secure that identity and how it's used to communicate different things about us, uh, and not just us but about entities and organizations. Uh, science is always in here because it's whatever the uh, fringe is on emerging uh, primary sciences, and then simplification, which is a theme that is going on throughout all of society because of the complexity that has been wrought by technology. Take those eight. Map them against the other six. And if you were going to do this in a traditional fashion, you'd start finding lots of clusters of data. Now, if you run it through an algorithmic approach, you can take those through a database, map the two together, and you start coming up with algorithmic correlations, which we're calling demand pools. Where are these things coming together, in essence? So you're taking what's changing in the world, what's changing in the world of finance or consumer transactions, slam them together. What you're trying to do is find the opportunities that emerge from that. You can start to cluster those into a heat map and say, here are areas of opportunity that we could go pursue. If you look at the data, it looks like this. It's basically a big pattern recognition exercise. If you map it, it looks like this. So there are those eight drivers of change on the left axis. On the bottom axis in blue, you see the domains of finance. If you map them together and search for these hits, you see the points of correlation. The higher on the map that that occurs, it's just the greater frequency. 
which means it's arriving in mass right now. And so should be, the stuff that's taller should be hotter because it's certainly more active in the blogosphere. At those intersections, if you go look at the, essentially the stories that you're pulling from the world, you start seeing things, for example, at the intersection of globalization and products, things like the unbanked services that are, that are beginning to emerge among communities without banks involved um, for the unbanked. Here's, and that's just one of countless examples. Any one of those peaks represents about 15 to 30,000 data points. Um, under the convergence of science, products and consumption, one of the things that became a big trend that you're seeing is essentially new risk models, new ways to anticipate risk. A lot of it is as a result of the unanticipated risk that came out of the uh, real estate and then the general financial turmoil of the recent meltdown. Digitization and experience suggest new forms of mobile banking and other transactions that you can do through the air uh, or the web. Um, identity converging with products and roles starts to reveal stories about um, kind of the new, newly evolving economy in the developed world about what we call inconspicuous consumption. So, the, you know, it's essentially the 1% being a little nervous now. Um, security, meaning the concerns that we have about protecting, for example, identity. Retirement insecurity, which was kind of the thesis of the work you and I were doing together in, in this sector. Um, and so, the question that this suggests for us in any of the queries that you do is to say, where has the future already arrived? So if I am an architecture student and I'm interested in working in the public sector, and what I mean by that is, let's say I have a dream to design museums or other public spaces, interior or exterior, um, then I could look at trends happening in the world to suggest where will there be emerging demand for the public consumption of tangible or intangible artifacts of our culture or history that need to be celebrated, but no one's worrying about celebrating yet today, so that I can position myself as the architect of choice specializing in a field that hasn't yet emerged. Of course, the problem with that is if it emerges just after you die. So trying to get the timing right <laughs> matters a lot. And so, so the reason that I showed you that three-dimensional map, that topographical map, is because the higher the mound of data, it is suggestive, although not completely predictive of, the more immediate the probability that this is showing up in multiple places and, is, and is, there's already latent demand for it. So if I am a specialist in it and can put out my shingle today that this is the kind of museum space that I design, here's the thesis that demonstrates that, and nobody else has done it yet, I'm the likely candidate. So finding the future in the right time frame is also essential. If you look at where, if you, if you take some of those intersections that I was suggesting and looked at where the future has already arrived, in the domain of risk modeling, for example, and managing uncertainty, you now see the BMW did it first, but you're seeing it in lots of vehicles now, all kinds of technologies interwoven in the electronics of the vehicle that permit it to do proximity detection and all kinds of other things that essentially notify you of risk. And what we're trying to do is ultimately get to the Google vehicle that's gonna drive you around with nominal risk at all. Um, but that, uh, those technologies are already in the hands of consumers. So if you're a financial services company and you believe that there might be hints of risk in say the uh, collateralized mortgage sector in, say, late 2008. You'd know it for sure if you were looking in the right place. And it was, in fact, after the, you know, after the meltdown that all the stories came out about, for example, mortgage brokers, the guys who aren't giving Peter his mortgage, uh, the mortgage brokers, <laughs> all the chit-chat they had among themselves at the time, like right before the meltdown, saying, can you believe we gave this dude a loan? <laughs> we would never have considered this guy last year. What is going on? This is awesome. I'm getting a bonus for doing this. Uh, you know, so they were basically celebrating their great good fortune, which was, if you had sort of a sober point of view about what that suggested, you'd realize we're heading to Armageddon. Um, because what that, what that results in is a huge inflation in the actual value of uh, real estate products. The, uh, the graph on the right is one of the first indicators of such technology. You might have heard of this. It came out 
a decade ago almost now. No, that can't be right. Six years ago now. Um, so it matters in Google years. Uh, because this is the Google flu indicator. Um, I just made that up. Copyright. <laughs> Google years. Um, they, uh, the, the, essentially what happened was Google notified the Center for Disease Control of flu outbreaks before the CDC, whose job it was to track those, saw them coming. Because what they were seeing were the hits of people saying, like, what do I do about a runny nose? Or, what do I, you know, where can I buy this kind of, uh, you know, Advil or whatever. And so they could see, and if you follow the patterns, because they're geolocated, you can see this is viral in, in the literal and, and original sense of viral, and it is happening in this community, and it's spreading at this rate, so you could anticipate when the flu is going to hit a zip code. And Google was able to do that in much the same way that in a very um, antique way, I observed happening in New York City in the 1990s when uh, Mayor Giuliani and the, now the chief of police for Los Angeles, Bratton, um, instituted a computer-based system to simply record the crime logs that were taking place across the various precincts in New York every day. And they literally were putting them on like a floppy disk and running them downtown with a siren on to, to, um, to get the data to be um, integrated so that they could start to read patterns. And in essence, what they determined, this thing was called CompuStat, and it was sort of the beginning of using computer analytics in order to forecast and avert crime. Essentially, what they were being able to do is see, much like the Google can show you where the virus is occurring, they could see where gang activity appeared to be occurring because of reports of broken windows and, and uh, you know, other kind of small acts of vandalism, which often preceded acts of felony uh, criminal activity. And so um, the, there's, there's much that we could do through the astounding acceleration of connectivity and digitization through social media, for example, simply by doing like Twitter scrapes that would allow you to determine what's happening in the world based on what people are talking about. Um, all you have to figure out is what is it I'm looking for exactly? And if you suspect that mortgages might be inflated, who, whose chatter should I be listening to? It's a big world out there. So focus, you, know, you start broad and then you narrow quickly. Oh my God, speed it up. <laughs> uh, sorry, we're gonna go a little faster. Um, in internet and mobile payment security, there's a whole array of things that have evolved. The gadget track was kind of a precursor in a large scale to the way that you can track your lost iPhone today. Um, but that was for almost any digital gadget that connects to a network. So it was a security mechanism that was allowing you to do that. So if you can track the location of a three-dimensional object, how much harder would it be for me to track, to, uh, track the, say, um, the number printed on a dollar bill in your wallet or the identity printed on your driver's license, et cetera. There was a remarkable instance um, experience that I had working with a company called Sizent, whose offices were raided by the FBI uh, on the day of the September 11th catastrophe because they had set up this computer algorithm to find uh, pedophiles. Was it pedophiles? It was child abductors. Um, in the state of Florida. And because we are organized, our law enforcement is organized by state, they'd only been authorized to do it in a few states, because in order to get the data, they had to get their computer to be deputized, which was pretty awesome for a third party company. <laughs> um, and so now, now that my disk drive can arrest you, um, <laughs> essentially what they could do was correlate data that came from both uh, public and private sources. So they could have your photo off for your driver's license, your uh, history of criminal conviction, and your most recent utility bill. So they could see what the probability, they knew your fate, oh, and they knew your driver's license, they knew your car registration. So if a child was lost and we saw a red van and had these three letters in the license plate, I can find you almost within an hour with this data, which is pretty important because the guy who founded this was kind of a dot-com billionaire who had a child abducted and, and killed. And the, the discovery that takes place if you suffer such a tragic event is that you realize that if you, don't, if you don't find that child within something like 20 hours, then the death rate goes to almost 100% uh, or dis, you know, permanent disappearance. So it's all about speed. And 
So Sizant went around being deputized by different states with some pace. What happened on several, September 11th was there was some data that suggested that the perpetrators had gone to flight school in Florida. And they knew about these guys because they were a law enforcement extension in Florida. They went down there and they, they were able, that's how they identified um, you know, the, 11, the 11 perps in this instance because they had them on record and could, could correlate the data. Um, so the reason I suggest this is this is completely outside of the domain of financial services, but it is all the stuff you'd need to do to secure financial transactions and identity. And it's already out there, the technology is there, you gotta buy it, license it, repurpose it, build it, you can own the marketplace uh, if, if you found this before someone else did and understand its value. Unbanked service is remarkable. The, I'm not gonna tell you all the stories of this stuff, but it's basically about communities coming together to allow each other to, and I'm sure you've seen instances or read instances of this where it essentially is taking us back to our roots as small communities, being able to entrust each other for a whole community, each put in a dollar, so that $50,000 is delivered to a person. It's a little bit like uh, the final scene in It's a Wonderful Life, where the whole, everybody in the community shows up uh, to lend a hand. And so it's a remarkable um, manifestation that has been made possible on a grand scale because of our digital connectedness. But one of the things I wanted to point out was that in doing a study, actually for the prior one in the mobile banking, we found the next generation of salt in sub-Saharan Africa. And this has been much publicized now, but if you go to dangerous borderlines between countries that are unsettled or uh, undergoing you know, some, uh, civil war, et cetera, the way that merchants travel now, and I'm talking about like Swahili tribesmen, is with a mobile phone, kind of an old school mobile phone, right, cheap one, um, and the transactions that they perform across borders with their fellow merchants are transacted in minutes. And what they do is they, they, they give each other minutes off their phones. And so it's become this ubiquitous international currency in their market that is safe, it's secure, it's you can steal my phone and you don't get my minutes, I mean, other than the ones you burn by calling it today. And so you, know, you could accumulate a bank with the phone company of $100,000 in the value of phone minutes that you could use across national borders, you basically evade taxes, it enables the liquidity of gray markets, it's a beautiful solution. So if you're a bank trying to figure out how to let people, which we're just catching up with now, like send each other cash through a text, which is still horrible if you've tried to use it other than sort of PayPal, they're doing it, tribesmen are doing it in Africa, and, you know, in increments of a minute. So it's, you know, it's completely feasible. And one of the other things that suggests is that oftentimes the developing world, well, let me say it a different way. The developing world can find the future arriving in the undeveloped world and draw analogies to the needs that consumers have in our economies. Um, but I think a better way to think of it is that the best way to find the future that's relevant to you is to go find extreme users. So for example, as I'm working trying to reinvent the ancient art of hospitality with our hotel, the analogy I use is not the best hotel, it's the best terminal, it's the best treatment center for terminal care. Sloan Kettering, Sloan Memorial Kettering in New York City is a remarkable cancer treatment center. The way that they have redesigned, in essence, the guest experience in their hotel room, where your life is at stake and every minute counts, is remarkable and heartwarming and very different from any experience you've ever had of a hospital room um, and essential when your life is at stake. And so if, if you're thinking about how am I gonna redesign a hotel room for a weary traveler, man, if I can make it functional for somebody whose life is at stake, it's gonna easily satisfy the needs of a weary traveler. If I'm trying to allow you to transact cash back and forth um, you know, through your phones, if I can find a tribesman who's figured out a way to do it, it can't be that tough. And you can overcome a lot of the ob latent objections, even the ones that we might foster within ourselves about why things can't be done when you find them being done nearby. So the question I would ask you to ponder is which of the trends that are going on around us today, the ones you already see, the ones you already read about, the ones that are already affecting you personally, are going to drive areas of opportunity for you in your next career. For those of you with responsibilities for this institution, 
what are the changes that it would suggest to your curriculum? Because our students need to be able to be anticipating demand that will arise next week, next year, next decade. What are the changes it suggests for literally the way we position LTU in the marketplace to differentiate in a way that suggests that we see the future first, we are finding it and we're enabling our students with it by giving them the mechanism to adopt it into the work that they do. This is old technology. This is what you do to find oil deposits. This is, this is what you do in scenario planning to do war gaming. And in essence, it suggests that when you're planning, about the dumbest thing you can do is have a plan. What you need are not less than four plans because you're planning for a future that has a low probability of showing up. So what you need to do is say, which are the variables that matter most? Is the economy going to be up or down? Am I going to be focused locally or globally? If I just take that, I need to say, what's my plan if the world starts showing up local and destitute or global and rich or the converse of those two axes? And what would be the indicators that those are arriving so that when I have my plan, I'm looking for leading indicators and I'm starting to diverge to the future that's starting to show up and that that plan is forever being replenished by the emerging data that, that surrounds us. That's a very difficult task. It basically says I'm driving fast with visibility, you know, with limited visibility. But in fact, what we're doing today is driving blind for the most part by presuming the present projects forward into the future, which it never does in any meaningful way for any meaningful duration. So what I'd ask of you is that you consider some of the trends that my partners and I use in the conversations that we have with our clients. And they're obvious to you and you'll see others. Among them are the, the facts that are, all these are self-evident today and are newsworthy already. That the globalization that's taking place across our economies makes something like a financial meltdown in this country ripple around the world. There is no such thing as an isolated virus economically anymore, nor any more than there is for bird flu. So the world is global, that's over, ain't going back. We need to adopt that as a thesis so that we understand that it is entirely probable that we are going to be a very different minority, regardless of your race, creed, or color today, you're going to be in a very different demographic class in not just this city, this country, but the world. Because I'll tell you, as, as, and I've just spent time in both India and China, and when you look at the emerging middle class coming into existence right now that are already globally connected to us, it changes everything in a way that we just haven't quite seen yet. Partly because the U.S. stupidly buffers us from it through immigration patterns and whatnot. Um, so it's happening, it's happening big. And the other thing that's happening is the aggregation of human beings to greater density, meaning urban centers, which is really one of the first innovations of mankind that made all the difference was getting together, um, is happening in a monumental way. And uh, if uh, maybe some of you are, are Chinese nationals who have spent time in China, but if you do the top 10 list of the major cities of the world, they're kind of in China now and New York. So it's, it's not really, obviously, you know, there's Mexico City and a lot of other stuff, but it's remarkable because few of us in the West have been to any of these cities because they didn't exist as cities not that long ago in your own lifetimes, your young lifetimes. Broadly accessible digital technology is now ubiquitous and in an exponentially increasing way because if any of you have young children like I do, you realize it's totally second nature now. We finally... I mean, it has always been second nature for a child to learn a language at an early stage of brain development, and we've introduced to them new languages and new devices. Each of you in your own childhood were the beneficiaries of this, which is why I had to program the VCR for my parents, and it's why my children have to like, hook up the Wii for me. It, 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 is, it is remarkable, and changed my diapers. Uh, the, the, when we think about what the implications for that are, though, that in essence there's a different language that's actually a global vehicle for the conversations that we have that is engaging in a different interface. It was a really interesting article in the wake of Steve Jobs' death about that basically was uh, a two-sided argument about the release of the 
iPhone 4S, the, the Siri you know, voice um, modulated phone, voice activated phone. And in essence, it was kind of like sad that, one argument was it was sad that they were putting out, right after Steve's demise, that they were putting out this, this sort of simple iteration of the same phone when everyone was expecting something great. And only slowly as people started investigating Siri and the uh, capabilities did it start dawning on people that we might actually finally escape the keyboard. There is an increasing sense, really obvious in our culture, in self-reliance. So this, uh, I mean, we see it in the form of wellness and uh, essentially the, the conversion from being a victim to being in charge of your own life. The conversion from seeking a doctor when you're ill to seeking a trainer to remain healthy or you know, any of a countless array of professions who can help you to do that or just your own knowledge. So that pervades all kinds of things, but we see it in, uh, pervades all kinds of things, and we see it in this country in part because we've gone through this and continue to go through the turbulence of our healthcare system. And um, so you see whole organizations uh, going through an exercise to try and reduce their costs of care for their own employees by enabling wellness and doing all kinds of things to promote things, largely through behavioral economics, which if you're not studying that, get on that, um, is remarkable in the way that it encourages us to do the things we should be doing or cho would choose to do, but we can't get past our own limitations of being naked apes. Transformational impact of social media has been an underpinning of much that we've discussed tonight. Um, I say discussed because you answered a question, otherwise, <laughs> that I've said. Um, but it's about the transformational impact of social media. This is a scene from Tahrir Square in, in Egypt, but, but in Tunisia first and all through the Arab Spring uh, and continuing through the Occupy New York phenomenon that uh, it seemed to be chasing me around the world. I was in London and they were occupying uh, St. Paul's and kind of wherever I went, all of a sudden the Occupy team would show up. Um, and it was a remarkable phenomenon of enabling a dialogue that went from, from 2D to 3D really rapidly and in ways that were self-organizing. It it's almost becoming its own organism. Its own, you could take a biological life form definition and say that we as a human culture are slowly becoming much more like an ant colony or a beehive because we're enabling what insects do through chemical exchange and we're doing it through electron exchange in order to be able to self-organize. It's a remarkable thing and it creates different amorphous communities that can do things that they never thought to do together because they hadn't met. Remarkable, remarkable. We are almost as cool as ants. <laughs> so the last, I believe the last one of these is sustainability practices. Now we've all got reason to be deeply concerned about the way that we've kind of abused the commons. I live in New York City um, and the Hudson River was the site, and I grew up in Cleveland where the rivers would catch on fire, but the Hudson River, uh, which was the site of one of those early um, uh, catastrophes that caused the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency, which was GE dumping uh, polyfluorocarbon, PCPs, whatever that, that word is, into the Hudson River. And it came to my attention the other day because we've seen recent studies of rapid evolution taking place in the Hudson River where the PCPs basically don't break down, they're, they're, they're in the silt level at the, at the, uh, at the bottom of the river, uh, particularly down in the, the silt that's down by where the um, Holland Tunnel is, if you're familiar with uh, New York's geography. And um, what they're finding is all these really weird morphed fish that uh, should have been killed by the tumors that are spontaneously created by close proximity to PCP. Um, but poly chloro <laughs> penal colonies, correct. Thank you, <laughs> Ralph. I, there we go. Um, Ralph actually knows what it is, but <laughs> I've got the microphone. Um, so the, the, the PCP um, proximity was creating this really strange rapid evolution that was killing off most fish, but not all. And so what they're finding from that is the possible uh, links to cancer prevention, much as we've seen historically in the analysis of shark tissue, which the sharks don't get cancer, by the way, uh, and there are very few um, life forms that don't, uh, that don't um, advanced life forms. So anyway, sustainability practices, right, cancer, sharks. 
Sustainability practices are about ensuring that we preserve the commons for the next generation and try not to blow it up you know, even while we're here. Um, and that has been a dream and a wish ever since I was a kid and there was a, an epiphany for the United States when there was an advertisement of a Native American with a tear in his eye as kind of litter scattered across the landscape. And it, that particular advertisement, kind of, which is a public service announcement, transformed in about a year the way Americans thought about throwing a styrofoam cup out of a car window, which was considered a reasonable thing to do in my childhood. So um, there are, from that early stage of the way that we behave around each other by picking up our socks in the commons that we all live in, is becoming now regimented, formalized, regulated, and now transactional. So you've got carbon trading and, and whole markets are arriving that not unlike salt, will make it possible for us to overcome the friction in that transaction by making it liquid. So there's, there's countless others of these. One that I won't go into is that um, demographically the world has never been older and it's gonna get older as an average, probably because we're living longer, uh, but mostly because birth rates have gone down considerably in the developed world and will increasingly go down in the rest of the world as they become, as, as these mass middle markets emerge into. There has been no instance even in, in sort of orthodox religious cultures where economic development didn't result in reduced headcount per household, uh, lower birth rates. And so as the two biggest uh, populations to emerge into the world economy show up, they also happen to be among the most uh, uh, productive in population growth, go to a zero growth rate, we're going to see the average age of consumers and of ourselves go up considerably. It creates all kinds of totally disruptive havoc. Japan in particular, which is gonna be super old, is gonna have a very small number of people who are earning a wage to support all the elderly who are retired. And, be, and because that's an isolated kind of uh, cultural community, it's gonna be very, very devastating in the future of their economy 10 years from now. So all of these are trends that are gonna have dramatic impact in your lives. The question is, what are you going to do about a global, urban, digital, self-reliant, connected, sustainable, emerging mass of people arriving in our world today? How's that going to affect your life? What's it going to do for your career? And maybe more importantly, what opportunities does it present? How does it suggest for you that there is going to be latent, unfulfilled demand as these trends converge? Had we time and little ways to group together, Faculty, I encourage you to do this with your classes tomorrow. Um, one of the things I would ask you to do is work in small groups and take two of these trends, any two that interest you, slam them together in the face of your professional goals and say, what does this do for my audience? What does this mean about needs that are gonna show up by the time I am practicing my profession in the field, like next week? Because they're already happening, right? But they're gonna happen bigger and you should be there to meet them. And now let's take a third one and a fourth one and you can start really pinpointing opportunities that are super interesting. And then what you have to start doing is looking for leading indicators so you can navigate your career in order to shift it if the timing doesn't show up as, as you had anticipated. And maybe you should have those four quadrants so you know which way to navigate. And you can take those trends and say, it shows up fast, it shows up slow, it shows up big, it shows up small. Here's where I should focus my attention based on the way that starts to happen. So take two of those and pose the question to yourself, what does it mean for my career, for my life, for my family? And why does this matter? For you personally, for the teams that you work with, for the companies that you engage with in the future or the organizations, I think Charles Darwin had it right and many people, myself included originally, failed to understand this, that he was saying, that it's not about the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent. It's those that are the most ready or responsive to change. So what I'm asking you to do is consider being more nimble and navigating with more foresight so that you can be more responsive to change because you're looking for it. And you're seeing it coming and you know when it's showing up, maybe before others do. So you can find the future first. And if you transfer, those of you who intend to practice this in a corporate setting as I do, you might translate this into the words of 
a former chairman of GE, who said, if you're not moving at the speed of the marketplace, you're already dead, you just haven't stopped breathing yet. It's roughly the same quote in a corporate setting. We have to be prepared for change. If you look at the rate at which households adopt new technologies, it's just one indicator of how rapid changes are occurring, you'll see it continues to accelerate. If you look at internet traffic as another indicator of connectedness in a digital environment that is global and increasing ever rapidly, it happens with greater speed and greater broadband uh, breadth. Um, you may have seen that there was just a cable run from Madagascar connecting it across the Indian Ocean to the world at broadband speeds. I mean, there's almost no corner of the world short of Antarctica yet that cannot be connected into this fiber network that allows us to all be together all at once. In fact, if you were a prognosticator about the future and said, you know the thing that hasn't shown up yet that I'm really looking forward to is time travel, I would argue that the telephone is time travel. FaceTime is serious time travel. I am all, I like, I can just prop an iPad up and be your face and then take you with me. And Peter and I can keep having the conversation. Well, it is kind of remarkable. We have time travel. We can, we can go anywhere in the world instantly now because of that and the ubiquity of those technologies. So, what's it going to mean for you? I thank you and ask what questions you have. I'm Roger Mater and that's my contact information. Thank you very much. For purpose of the video, if I could attempt to restate that correctly, where I've got this wrong, the underlying question is how do you account for margins, margin of error in this, which is in part my, my you know, the error that I was talking about was timing, but there's also all kinds of lateral potential error there. And also, maybe more importantly, whatever paradigm you're bringing to it, uh, you know, such as neoliberal or Austrian economics or whatever the model is that you're using as your framework, you basically look for the future where you think to look of it, look for it. And so to your point, I've shown you examples of stuff that I've chosen to look for, which may or may not be the most relevant stuff. There's an also conversant uh, language about this. Refer well, you may have heard of a book by Nicholas Taleb called The Black Swan, which is basically saying when you look at projecting the future, in this case investment banking was the, was the model that was being used, he was arguing, and I believe rightly so, that there are all kinds of paradigms that we don't have the wherewithal to anticipate. You couldn't, for example, if you were forecasting the airline industry and what the travel logs were gonna look like so that you could do the logistics for how many aircraft you needed to have, how much fuel you needed to be advanced purchasing in the marketplace a year ago, you would not have anticipated an Icelandic volcano erupting and blocking the sun out across the North Atlantic and essentially making it impossible for jets to travel through that airspace. And, and all the implications that would have. That is a black swan event, totally disruptive to a whole industry, and actually a ripple effect to lots of industries because we still get on airplanes and travel in cans in order to go see each other. So, in answer to your question, can't solve either. You have to anticipate both. So the main way that you reduce margin of error is, and fortunately most of these technologies enable it, is by not doing it alone. So you've, you basically take group data in order to test for the validity of your own assumptions, excuse me. And the second thing is, you, you expect that there will be black swans. There will be unanticipated events, so you basically need a go bag. Like, what's my contingency plan when the unexpected ain't in my game plan, but it shows up? It just a, as a fair finer point would be not the anticipation or the assumption of margin error, but the uh, quantification. Yeah. How do you quantify it in order to really, because what you seem to be um, describing here is trying to take, when you your examples at the beginning of Gurn, uh, yeah. you know, what they were, what, what they were, I mean, that was a lifetime of experience uh, qualitatively um, put together to drive answers, right? right? They weren't doing these kind of, uh, I mean, sabermetrics baseball, but that kind of meta analysis. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so, good so, so, so then, um, how, how do you take that and apply it to the margin of error in order to balance that against what your ultimate conclusion is in order to get something closer to possibly reality? The, the ability to quantify qualified data is not unlike meteorology. So the degree to which you can trust your weatherman is the degree to which you can trust almost any prognostication about a future that's coming. 
because in fact there's lots of variables in what weather is going to show up in Detroit tomorrow, um, but there's a whole profession that's evolved around that that says, here are the patterns of the past, here's the leading indicators we're seeing today, here's the trend pattern that we're mapping. Now take all of the tools that that suggests and say, how would I apply them in the context of the problem that I'm trying to solve for? And they'll be half-assed by comparison, right? Because that's a whole profession that's existed for 100 years that has been quantifying the data, so it's got a huge historical backlog. So you won't. What you'll do is you'll have qualified data, human judgment, and loads of error, which is better than having none of those. Sir. Oh, it's there. We may not be. The problem about the future, I think, is not, it's not what it used to be. In other words, <laughs> that is the title for this thing next time it happens. So I, just, I just said the word nostalgia. I just said human being, being a human, anything. And then we have data, and then we have human being. What is the creative lenses? What is the creative legal canvas that we need to? Oh, it's easy. Getting it right sucks, but <laughs> prognosticating is easy. Um, so for purposes of the recording, let me just attempt to recount that. We are human beings who, in your profession, are basically operating in a creative realm. And the reliance on quant data in a world, in essence, digital forms in a world that's highly analog, uh, the creative flow, if you will, that is very difficult to anticipate when it will arrive and what form it will take suggests it's very difficult for us to adopt these, this thinking into the creative process. Peter and I did that by each taking half of that equation. His job was to be creative and my job was to count. And we teamed together because I couldn't mimic his particular genius nor he mine. And so what we found was if we worked together, we could enable each other better. So if our job was to try and create a solution, a quite a creative solution to a problem, my job was to go find the quant, his job was to find the qualitative data, and for us to bring those together in myriad options that would suggest what possibilities might exist. There's a really interesting phenomenon that suggests that your brain might be in the creative minority of mental biology in the world that I think might be helpful to you in the, in the way you think about this. I am in the majority, the boring majority, who think essentially, you know, it's a, it's a right brain, left brain kind of argument. Let me put it to you a different way. At the Institute of Design in Chicago, and at Kellogg Business School at Northwestern University, and at the University of Chicago, a colleague of mine and a mentor teaches the exact same design theory program to master's design students as he does to MBA students in those two esteemed programs. He gives them the first day of the first lecture, he gives them the same case problem doesn't give them a mechanism by which to solve it, wants the solution the next day, small teams go away. The problem last year was, and he might still be using the same one, was you are charged with eliminating the scourge of malaria from Africa, and ideally from the world. But let's just start with the small continent of Africa. Um, here are the, basically, you know, the basic data about malaria and the way that it uh, manifests, etc. They go off in small teams, they come back the next day. They basically have to go crazy for one day on their first day of class, awesome guy. Um, they love him. Um, he is awesome, actually. Um, the design students solve it differently. He's, he's done this for years now, every time than the MBA students. A, a typical MBA student answer is, 
Okay, this is big and this is bold, and I've got a spreadsheet to show you how we do it. But what we would do is we would combine three different agents. So we would use DDT to wipe out, uh, you know, basically wipe out the latent mosquito population. We would use uh, drainage and irrigation equipment to reduce uh, stagnant water pools where they breed, and we would send uh, mosquito netting in this kind of quantity to whole communities, and we'd have to move people around while we, while we did this carpet bombing of the mosquitoes. And our spreadsheet suggests that were we to do this, we could save roughly a million lives for a cost of $12,000 per life. Um, thank you very much. And he gives them an F for what is basically a sample case. Because he said, thank you very much. You've saved countless lives at a reasonable cost. You didn't solve the problem. I don't want malaria. I still got malaria. I still got people dying. I might have more malaria next year because you've wiped out you know, the, the already ill crowd. So you didn't solve it. Goodbye. Design students solve it for the most part. And you get answers like this. We need to requisition the entire US Navy. We're going to put oh, the entire population of the west, of basically the Ivory Coast, on aircraft carriers and put them 40 miles off the coast. We're then going to use nuclear weapons to eliminate every species <laughs> in that zone. Then we'll offload them, move a little farther down the coast. And we will basically strip mine biology from the surface of Africa and take with it malaria. You get an A. <laughs> you may wipe out humanity, but damn, you killed malaria. <laughs> so, the, and the way that he, and he wasn't sure why this was happening. But in, but in effect, he was getting solutions from design that would solve the problem in a dramatic way because that was the only way he could solve the problem, at least with today's technology. And so, when he dissected it, what, he was trying to find the thought process underpinning each of those teams. And basically what he found is that people like myself, the majority of human thinkers, non-designers, project forward from the present linearly. We say, here's what's possible. Let me scale it up big and take it into the world. I have fought this inclination by working with people like Peter who, if he is actually mentally organized this way, would solve the problem in reverse. And what he would say is, ah, what would need to be true for malaria to be gone? And then how could I create the conditions by which each of those variables be put in place? And let me just, just you know, describe ways that would achieve those variables. And you get things like aircraft carriers and whole populations in nuclear war. Um, <laughs> nice thinking. Um, but, but my point is that there, the end point that comes full circle is that I can't solve it and you can't solve it, but maybe together we can get closer. So because there is a creative sort of confluence of talents that I can't put my finger on. I could maybe deconstruct the way that you, you know, wrote a note of music or that you crafted a, a piece of artwork or that you designed a building. I couldn't replicate it, but I could maybe come to understand it. And my guess is that if you did it through a creative medium, like I just described, you're doing it by saying, what am I trying to create first? And, and what's, what magical confluence of design thinking would allow that to be possible? Whereas I'm just stacking bricks, because I'm building from the present. So together, though, I can count bricks. You can design genius. And you know, we'll do something that is not only beautiful, but also affordable and can be built, which is kind of a nice way to come together. Which one was the hardest? I'm still here. I'm still well done. So Congratulations. Uh, you throw me a bone, I will. <laughs> I'm glad to think about it. You're very welcome. Thank you for your question. I have a question for you. This is kind of more in line with, I think, what a lot of the students probably think about and hear a lot in the room, and that is you know, there are a lot of articles out now, or not 
kidding that one of the worst things you could possibly do is try to pursue architecture because you know architects are, are fairly high rate as in many magazines and, and websites love to publish uh, of unemployment. And maybe I'm crazy and, and since you study this stuff and mm -hmm. it's just my intuition and knowledge to you, you can tell me I am, but I actually think it's like one of the best times to be an architect. And maybe it's because I'm interested in how architecture and how design can actually participate in redefining itself based around opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like just my own gut instinct is that one of the problems is, is the pr profession and the practice is unwilling to adapt. Am I incorrect in that? Or uh, that may be why they're suffering. You're, you're a better judge of why, but I'll tell you my observation. Okay, that's what I'm um, And the question was, uh, the future of architecture uh, is constantly getting death notices. How do we avert the funeral? Um, the, sorry, that's a glib way of saying it. But, um, the best people I work with are architects who are applying the theory of architecture to solving problems different than an engineered building. They are remarkable, and it's because they're architects. Because you apply that genius to problems broadly, and I would say this, by the way, of the application of industrial engineering to things other than engineering um, industrially, um, because essentially what you're learning is a thought process mechanism and tools to solve very complex problems with the, with the craft of a guilt, which has history and latency that's really important and really valuable, but maybe mired in a narrow definition of how you apply that method. And so my suggestion to you is that you think of architecture writ large because there is much to solve in the world and the, and the method of architecture is as good as any I've seen for tackling these problems. And I mean architecting a cure for malaria. That's how I describe architecture and that's how I've seen the genius of architecture applied among what you might describe or the, or the industry might describe as an unemployed architect who I see very gainfully employed in changing the world just not through an enormous edifice. You're welcome. Hi, Amy. And Amy's will be the last question. You and I are going to have a drink. <laughs> yes, Amy, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us as architects and designers, you know, there's a variety of uh, opportunities, let's say, in the city of Detroit. We talked about uh, latent worth, and so latent worth in the city of Detroit would be building stock and vacancy. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have the audience or the interface um, in design. There's not a framework in which Peter and I, who are running a studio in, in Detroit. Which I visited, and it's lovely. Thank you. Amy just asked about the way that I interact with my clients or you know, the kind of interface that we're having here tonight in order to make them receptive to this conversation and to be able to adopt it and put it in the context of some of the latent opportunities and challenges that the landscape of Detroit represents today. Um, and I would suggest that you do, in essence, what I described in terms of finding the future. Let's use the example we just brought up. There is a huge level of either value or cost ascribed to the vacancies in the beautiful historic architecture of just downtown Detroit, let alone the surrounding uh, urban plateau. And I was visiting it today. It's kind of, I mean, they are all crack houses waiting to happen, but they are frigging gorgeous, right? And if I could bring in a Huey helicopter to take a couple of them away, I would. The, Reason it's challenging, I think, is because it's a little bit like your question about, about the way that we think of architecture. I think that those structures were built to house humanity amid density, a density that is no longer relevant. Right? 
So how, so that's, that's a little bit of this notion of reconstructing the past. Like, so why does this building exist? What form does it seek to serve? And then what alternative uses might it suggest when the world changes and we no longer have density to be served? Or economic constituents who can afford the same model? The industry, in, in essence, that built much of the economy that, that begat those buildings. Um, and there's lots of interesting potential solutions if we start looking outside of Detroit and outside of the traditional uses of space. So for example, I was recently at Art Miami, uh, which was simultaneous to Art Basel in Miami. There were two major art shows going at one time. Art Basel, being the more established, had a beautiful venue. Art Miami put up this remarkable tent structure. It was basically a tent city at scale that was kind of like Cirque du Soleil, I mean, in terms of the edifice that you, were in the, uh, that you were canopied underneath. And it was better, and it was more beautiful, it was completely temporary, but it was a more productive space for what you were trying to achieve, because you could actually make it the flexible space that you needed for that event. So that would be an example of creating a sort of space solution, an architected solution to a space problem that addressed a number of different needs. So now, let's go find the instances where, we can do this from a number of ways, where density has been eliminated. So we've gone from density to a reduction density. You can do this at an atomic level. Like, stuff is heavier or lighter because there's more marbles in the basket, right? So if you look at the underlying physics of examples where you reduce density, well, in essence what you're doing with atoms is allowing them to move faster. So you, cre you create a different temperature. So I use that, I mean you can go to primary sciences for your analogies because in fact the way change happens is not unlike the way a snowball rolls down a, a hill. There are really interesting lessons to take from nature around us. So if the affect that has occurred is reduction in density for the purpose of its use, where do we see that happening elsewhere? And you know, if I did it spontaneously, I won't come up with great ones, but you can find them, right? And you'll find, and you know, it, it results in things like creating, you repurposing the existing space by carving out the shell um, in order to serve a different purpose for a low density audience. It could be that what you're doing is um, uh, doing sort of a, a cost analysis for different ways that you'd apply it two different constituencies. It's a macroeconomic challenge though, because essentially what you're gonna have to do when you've got low density is attract an audience you know, where there is plenty, in this case, plenty of empty space. So how do I do that? And I, that needs to be a conversation with the city and maybe the state about you know, how do we bring a biotech industry or some other uh, infrastructure um, demand that, that pulls audiences. How do we get Michigan, not through traditional things like tax rebates, to create a haven for, for re not refugees, but for refuge? Like, who are the populations that we would like to have that the rest of the world doesn't? Let's get them here. How can, how, how can we create transport laws between Canada and just Michigan, and in particular the municip municipality of Detroit, that allows the immigrants that can come into Canada but not remain resident, who couldn't otherwise remain in the United States, come across that damn bridge. And we'll fill all those buildings, and we'll have this really interesting Portlandia burst into this town. Um, and it's kind of waiting to happen, right? But you don't have enough attraction. The climate blows, there's a lot that's not great about it, but you still have great industry, you still have great institutions like this one, and you still have a sort of latent population that's really interested in answering that question. So we've got about 12 more years to solve this, and then, it's, then the solutions start getting very sparse. So we need to do it now. And unfortunately, some of them are long-term solutions. But the snowball analogy, let me go to it. God, I'm all over the shop. The snowball analogy is important to me because I was having a conversation this morning with an with a investment banker who was talking about funding something we were doing with this ho hotel client of mine. And he was an entrepreneur who was seeking investment funding. And essentially what we concluded about innovation, about a startup, about a renaissance, as in the city of Detroit, is that you basically have something that looks like a small snowball. And if it has a snowball's chance in hell of making it to the bottom of the hill and having impact, 
it has to follow the forces of physics that suggest that mass times uh, momentum create force. And so you either have to move that small thing really damn fast, or you have to make it sticky enough that as it's rolling, it gets big fast. And the optimal thing is to both accelerate and expand in order to have meaningful impact. The way that you do that when you're trying to do something at scale, like repopulate Detroit, is by, to do it at mass and at scale and with speed, is to use the biggest damn levers you've got. So you have gotta get the automotive industry and crank that lever and get them to do what is necessary to get the best engineers around the world who the US prohibits from entering this country or staying here, even after they earn their PhDs here, to live in Detroit, because we make it happen. And they gotta pull the lever of government that says, how is that gonna be possible as a test bed so that we can provide political cover to the president who can't make that happen in our current political environment, but the US might let it happen in Detroit. Because who the hell cares about Detroit and the rest of the United States? I mean, but that's an advantage, right? You can swing that. So there's, there's ways we can solve it, but you're gonna have to pull some big levers. I think you can pull some big levers. Thank you, guys. Well, Roger, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.